Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Brooke Snelling and I'm a Senior Product Marketing Manager at Iovation, a TransUnion company. Iovation's fraud and authentication solutions make it safer for you to do business online. Today we are presenting Synthetic Identity Fraud, How Cyber Criminals Complete Their Hack, with Brett Johnson, keynote speaker and cybersecurity consultant at Angular Fish Security. We had the privilege of listening to Brett talk to us about social engineering and ATO back in August. We are looking forward to hearing about synthetic identity today. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our special guest, Brett Johnson, and synthetic identity fraud. Uh, we are very excited to partner with Brett on this topic because he is considered a leading authority on internet crime, identity theft, and cybersecurity. Take it away, Brett. Hey, thank you, Brooke. I appreciate it. And thank you, Iovation for bringing me in, much appreciated. We're here to talk about synthetic identity theft. I guess the first question would be, Brett, why on earth should we listen to you? Well, I'll tell you why. The United States Secret Service, they called me the original internet godfather. So what did it take to get that title? What it took was me being convicted of 39 felonies, being placed on the United States most wanted list, escaping from prison, and, I built the first organized cybercrime community. It was called Shadow Crew. It was a precursor to today's darknet and darknet markets, and it laid the foundation for the way modern cybercrime channels still operate today. So that is basically my past criminal history, and I want to be clear about this. This presentation is, is going to have kind of a walkthrough on how synthetic fraud is committed. I am not trying to glorify crime. I am not sitting here going to bask in my criminal activity. There's absolutely nothing to be proud of in being a criminal. It took me over 40 years to be able to turn things around, and that was only through the help of my sister, my wife now, and the FBI giving me a chance. But not only that, but people like you that are listening, people like Iovation who have given me an opportunity to use the knowledge and information I acquired as a lifetime criminal to now help protect people and organizations against the type of person that I used to be. That being said, I am very, very well versed in fraud, identity theft, cybercrime, synthetic fraud. So going back to my history, what Shadow Crew did, and let's look at this next graphic, what Shadow Crew did is it provided a platform, a structure for organized cybercrime to thrive. So if we look at this, at, this, at this graphic that we're looking at right now, this is what I call the cybercrime triangle. So inside of that, you have the person. For a person, for a cyber criminal to engage in cybercrime, three things have to be inherent in that person. Willingness, ego, and knowledge. So what do I mean by that? Let's look at the willingness. The criminal has to be willing to commit that specific type of crime. So what I mean by that is, say we take an, a regular traditional identity thief. That identity thief may be willing to steal the identity, the personal information of a millennial or a middle-aged person and steal all the money out of their bank account or set up new accounts and commit fraud, something like that. But is that same identity thief willing to take over the social security benefits of a senior citizen and basically take every bit of money that they've got for two to three months while that person is, has absolutely nothing to live on? Maybe not. Maybe that criminal's moral compass is turned enough north that they're not willing to do that. They're sitting there thinking, you know, I can't do that. That's just wrong to do that. I, I can't rip off somebody's entire monthly benefit and leave them without any food. So that's what I'm talking about. What type of crime is the cyber criminal willing to commit? The next thing is the ego. And ego plays a huge part in cyber crime because that single person has to believe that that small single person that may be sitting in their mom's basement is able to defeat a billion dollar company or a billion dollar security company. It's kind of like David and Goliath. For you to really engage in cybercrime, you have to have that, that ego to do it. You have to believe that you're better than a billion dollar company. And then finally, you have to have the knowledge to commit the crime. You can have the willingness. You can be willing to commit any crime you want to. You can have the ego to commit it as well. But if you don't have the actual knowledge to commit it, you're useless. And that brings us into this triangle that the person operates inside of. And that triangle consists of the three necessities of cybercrime. Those three necessities are gathering the data, committing the crime, and cashing out. All three things have to work in conjunction. If they don't, the crime fails. The problem is 
is that a criminal is not good at all three necessities. A criminal is good in one necessity. Sometimes he's good in two. Rarely can the criminal do all three. And that is why we see that overall world of organized cybercrime, the forums, the marketplaces, the dark web and surface web groups. They allow that one specific criminal to network with criminals who are good in areas where he is not. And of course, one of those areas that they like to work in is synthetic fraud. Synthetic fraud is the fastest growing form of identity theft on the planet. It's 80% of all new account fraud, losses over $50 billion. And here's the caveat. Most people simply don't know about it. I've been speaking about synthetic fraud for almost three years now. When I began speaking about synthetic fraud, I would ask an audience, a financial institution or a Fortune 500 company, how many people know what synthetic fraud is? And maybe, maybe one or two people would know. Now, fortunately, over the past few years, not only because of me, but because of all these other people who have been adamant about getting information out about this new fraud, now what we're seeing is, is that an audience, most of them at least have heard of it. They may not really understand how it operates, why it's so easy to commit, things like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you look at some of the stats, 20% of all credit card losses of those chargebacks are estimated to be due to synthetic fraud. 5% of all credit card debt. Think about that for a second. So 5% of all credit card debt is due or estimated to be due to synthetic fraud. And an average loss or an average charge off is $15,000. 2016 losses, $6 billion. Over $50 billion in losses today. That's the reason that synthetic fraud is the fastest growing financial crime on the planet. So why is it like that? Why does that happen? If you look at cybercrime, cybercrime tends to succeed through a series of failures across a variety of systems. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is if you own a company, if you're a target of a company, typically what happens is, is there's a series of security failures or failures with, uh, within other institutions outside of your control before you even become targeted by that attacker. If we look at synthetic fraud and that same type of understanding, why does synthetic fraud work? It works because we have a series of failures. We have a failure at the Social Security Administration. In 2011, the Social Security Administration, they randomized Social Security numbers, meaning you could no longer tell the year the Social was issued or the state it was issued from. Now, the Social Security Administration, they did that in order to combat identity theft. Because it turns out, if you're issued a social security number prior to 2011, if I know the last four of that social security number, if I know enough about you, basically the year you were born and the state you were born in, it's pretty easy for me to get the first five numbers. Now, the Social Security Administration, they saw that identity theft happening, and they were like, we have to stop that. So the way they stopped it was by randomizing the number. And it stops that type of fraud completely. If you're, if you're issued a number after 2011, you can't do that anymore. You can't, an identity thief cannot just come up with those five numbers anymore. But when that happens, what it now allows a criminal to do is either fabricate a social security number using the social security algorithm, or it allows a criminal to use a child's social security number that was issued after 2011 and to commit this type of crime. So that's the first failure, the first weakness. Another weakness is the credit bureau system itself because credit bureaus don't know you exist until basically you tell them you exist. If they've never seen that number, that information that's coming into the system applying for credit, the chances are the application will be denied, but when it's denied, it will actually build a profile using that new information that's being submitted into their system. And once it's in their system, they, rec they recognize that as a living person unless there's some sort of security or measures being taken to identify synthetic fraud at that point. We also have this thing in the United States called credit piggybacking. It's great. For example, if you're a parent and you have a child, as that child goes off to enter into adulthood and apply for credit and everything else, what you can do is you can add them onto your credit cards as authorized users. Now, you don't have to let them use the credit card or anything else like that. But when you add them on as an authorized user, it actually will bump up their credit score. It will give them a start in a new credit life, which is great. It's, it's legal in the United States, and I recommend all parents do that. But it's also one of these problems 
when it comes to committing synthetic fraud. And we'll walk through that here in a second. The other thing we have is traditional fraud models simply don't flag synthetic fraud. As far as victims go, certainly there are victims. There's merchants, retailers, financial institutions, creditors, the credit bureau system, the Social Security Administration. There are tons of victims there. The problem is, is that the traditional victim, that identity theft victim, that person, most of the time, they don't even know they're a victim because usually it's a child. Right now, it's a child that's, commit, that's, that's the victim of this. Well, the child doesn't know that they're a victim because they're a kid. They're not applying for credit. And they typically won't know until they go to apply for credit. So what we see is criminals that are using the, the Social Security number of, say, a child that's four years old, that gives the criminal 13, 14 years of a head start before that child even knows they were a victim of identity theft. Because of stuff like that, it's hard to, to have a complaint or have a fraud system that actually identifies that as fraud. So these traditional models don't work. And finally, one of the big things right now, and I used to complain about this a lot, that it didn't matter what the definition was on, on certain types of crime. You can call it whatever you want to. But the problem is, when you're looking at synthetic fraud, you've got financial institutions that will sometimes flag a type of identity theft as traditional fraud, and another institution will, will flag it as synthetic fraud. So when you're two different institutions and one's calling it traditional identity theft and another one's calling it synthetic identity theft, when they talk with each other, they're using a completely different language, a completely different understanding, a, a different definition, kind of like the Tower of Babel of fraud. They're using a different definition of, of what's going on there. So they're really unable to communicate properly with each other. And what does that mean? That means for the criminal that it's much easier for him or her to commit this type of synthetic fraud across multiple institutions. So that being said, let's try to use kind of maybe a definition for what synthetic fraud is. So what I've said is, is that what is synthetic fraud? It's a combination of fictitious and sometimes real information, social security number, date of birth, et cetera, used to create new identities to perpetrate financial fraud. Now that being said, what on earth? does that mean? I think that the best way to explain what that means is to give a walkthrough on how synthetic fraud is committed, how fraudsters are actually committing synthetic fraud. The first step is to create the identity. So typically what's happening now is a criminal will go on the dark web. He will buy the, the PII, the social security number of a child. On the dark web, you can buy these social security numbers for $2. For $2, you get the kid's social, date of birth, mother's maiden name, name, address, or you know, place of birth. So that's $2. Now, the only thing the criminal needs is just the social security number. So the criminal is going to take the social security number, he's going to add a name to it, an adult date of birth, an address, a phone number. From there, he's going to apply for credit. Now, I said previously, credit bureaus don't know you exist until you tell them you exist. So what will happen is the criminal is looking to try merge the account. And what I mean by that is that this cyber criminal, this identity thief, the synthetic fraudster, is wanting to create the credit report within all three bureaus at the same time. For that to happen, the application that he's submitting, that credit application that he's submitting, has to ping all three credit bureaus, TransUnion, Experian, Equifax. All right? Now, typically what that means is something like a car loan, a mortgage refinance, something like that. And yes, I said mortgage refinance. It doesn't matter if the criminal doesn't have a house, if that synthetic identity doesn't own a home. The idea is still to submit the application to get that ping going into the credit bureau system. So what will happen is he will the criminal will fill out the application. He will submit it. That application will be denied. But because the credit bureau system hasn't seen that information before, what happens is when it's denied, it will actually create a credit report in that synthetic fraud, that synthetic identity's name. So now you have that ghost in the system. That synthetic identity now has a credit report. Now, the idea now is to pump up that credit score to try to get that credit score as high as you can in order to cash out as fast as you can. So what do you do? The first stop is open source intelligence, because what happens is on a credit pool, when you apply for credit, it's more than just pulling your credit report. Creditors are looking for some sort of information that connects you with the address, any type of public databases. They do kind of this, this stuff as well. 
So for fraudsters to handle that, fraudsters know that, for fraudsters to take advantage of that, what they need to do is they need to make sure that any type of web crawlers or databases start to pull that name associated with that address. First stop tends to be a site like listyourself.net, which is a free white pages listing service. So what you do is you go in, the criminal goes in, he puts in that synthetic information. He puts in the name, the address, the phone number, he hits submit. Within a couple of weeks, that address is then associated with that synthetic identity. That address will start to receive a physical spam mail in that synthetic's name. At the same time, any type of web scrapers out there will start to associate that name with that address. While the criminal is doing this, he or she also starts to open up rewards cards, grocery, pharmacy, airline. He, may, he or she may start some social media account. So Facebook, LinkedIn, something like that. You don't have to, but hey, it can't hurt. So that takes care of all the, the open source intel that might be, be needed to be gathered for this fraud to happen. The next stop, and here's, this is not a necessity, but typically it happens. Criminals then go to using some of these secured credit cards. So why? Now, a secured credit card really doesn't do anything for your credit score, but there are a couple of secured credit card companies out there that for a minimum deposit, they give you more credit than what you deposited. And for those people who don't know what, what a secured credit card is, is typically you pay a credit card company $200 and they give you $200 worth of credit. Well, there are a couple of companies that you can pay them $39 or $49, and they will give you two or $300 worth of credit. And that's what these fraudsters are looking at. They're saying, okay, I can pay $49 and I can get $300 worth of credit. I'm immediately making money on this profile. Now, again, it doesn't really do anything for the credit score itself, but you're immediately making money. In order to boost up that credit score, typically, historically, what we've been seeing is this idea of credit piggybacking. Now, that's 49%. Today, the statistic is 49% of all of these synthetic profiles have credit piggybacking attached to it. And let's walk through how that works on the synthetic side when a synthetic fraudster is actually committing this crime. So what will happen is, is, Brooke, since you're online with me, I'll pick on you. I'm a synthetic fraudster. I would come to you and I would say, hey, Brooke, why don't you add me on as an authorized user of one of your credit cards? No, 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 no. I don't get your credit card. I, it doesn't affect your credit score whatsoever. I'm just going to be an authorized user on there. And you'll look at me and you'll say, Brett, you do look trustworthy. I think I will do that. So you'll add me on as an authorized user of just one of your cards. Now, the next reporting cycle of that one specific card, that card then becomes, that card's history then becomes my credit history. If the debt ratio is good enough, if the available balance is high enough, if the card has been alive long enough, what I can do as a synthetic fraudster is add two of these trade lines. They're called trade lines. What I can do is add two of these trade lines onto that synthetic profile. I can boost the credit score from a zero to a 760 plus in 30 to 45 days. So then what do you do? Well, then it simply depends on the skill level of the fraudster. So if the fraudster is a novice, if the fraudster simply doesn't understand how to properly cash out, how to maximize the, the crime that he or she is committing, they can apply for personal loans. They can get furniture. They can go down and get a car or an ATV or something like that. Typically, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 cash out range at that point. If it's a more skilled identity thief, there's an old trick of actually setting up accounts, making payments for a few months, and then cashing out like that. So they can do that type of fraud as well. And we're looking at a, at a profit range for a criminal of around thirty to $40,000. What we see mostly talked about in the media, though, is this idea of mixing real information with synthetic information to profit like that. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is a criminal, so again, say that I am the synthetic fraudster, and I want to victimize Brooke. So I'm picking on her today. So I want to victimize Brooke. What I would do is, is I would go to a criminal database, something like robocheck.cm, which is a criminal database of people's social security numbers and dates of birth. It advertises 170 million 
lookups for, for, for United States citizens. So 170 million uh, social security numbers and dates of birth at $2.90 a piece. I would go to that site, I would buy Brooke's social security number and her date of birth. The only thing I'm gonna use that information for is to apply for an EIN, an employer identification number. Why? Because I can't do that using synthetic information. I have to have real information to do that. So that's the only thing I'm gonna use her personal information for is just that EIN. At the same time, I'm gonna to go to the dark web. I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna buy a child's social security number for $2. I'm gonna take that social security number. I'm gonna put Brooke's name to it, Brooke's date of birth to it, but a different address, a different phone number, and I'm gonna build up that synthetic identity with her name attached to it to that high 760 score. Once I have Brooks Real EIN and I have the synthetic profile built up for that 760 score, I'm gonna mix them together and I'm going to apply for business credit. Why? An application for business credit doesn't look at the business. It looks at the person applying for that credit. That person, that synthetic, has a 760. Now, why do I do that? Because the profit potential, the credit limit on that, the, the available balance that's given out to these, these types of profiles is in the $150,000 to $200,000 range, and you can cash that out usually within about six months. So that is basically the, the skill levels and what we see with this type of fraud happening. And there are some variations on that. So what I've described here is the historical way that this type of fraud is happening. There are some variations to that, though. So the first variation that we're seeing now, so, so historically, criminals have used credit piggybacking to build up these profiles' credit scores. Now, criminals have started to understand that financial institutions, credit bureaus, security companies are now seeing that credit piggybacking is one of these avenues to pump up that credit score. Now, that being said, criminals understand that, so they look for new avenues to build up these credit profiles, these credit scores. One of the ways they're doing that is creating fictitious businesses or buying shelf corporations and reopening those corporations, using those corporations to report directly to the credit bureau system. So what we saw in the past, over the past year, and that, that, that was actually stopped recently, what we saw in the past is that they also use the court system. So filing liens, having those liens done away with, that used to report to the credit bureau systems as well. And there was a way to get that reported to a bureau system. So these days, criminals have stopped that, but they're going more toward the primary types of trade lines, opening up businesses that report directly to the credit bureau systems or having partners with some of these businesses that report to it. So they're actually engaged in crime conspiracies with some businesses that report directly to the credit bureau system. They're also layering these identity profiles. So what we're seeing is, is that a criminal will open up or start one synthetic profile. He'll build that synthetic profile up to that high 760, but he won't cash it out. What he'll do is he'll actually use that profile kind of as like a seed bank for any other profiles that he's building up. So he has one primary profile. He builds that up to a high 760, has the best credit in the world he can get for the synthetic profile. At the same time, he's building 15 or 20 other profiles, and he uses that main primary profile to add on authorized users of these other synthetic identities that he's building up. The ultimate goal, of course, is to cash them all out at the same time. Now, what we're seeing as well is the Social Security Administration, they're getting ready to allow creditors to access the Social Security database to actually see, okay, is this a real Social Security number that's applying for credit? Is it, is it the Social Security number of the child that's applying for credit? So criminals know this is going to happen. So what they're doing is, is they're already looking for avenues to keep committing this type of synthetic fraud, even though they may not be able to use a child's social security number or fabricate a social security number. Typically what they're doing now is they're looking at I-10s, individual tax identification numbers. So if you've got an immigrant that's coming over the United States to work or anything else like that, he or she is typically issued an I-10 so they can pay taxes. Well, you can still use that I-10 to build up a credit profile, a credit report, build up that credit score. Criminals know that, so, so a lot of these immigrants go back home. Well, that I-10 is still active, so they can use that to build up a credit report. They can use the social security number of a prisoner, anyone that, that doesn't have a credit score. And here's the big secret of that. CNBC, and, and actually it was 2015, CNBC, they had a report that said 45 million Americans did not have 
credit scores. What that means is, is that 45 million Americans are potentially victims or could be victims of synthetic fraud because the synthetic fraudster can use their numbers to build up credit scores for them and then cash out like that. So we see that. We see this, this idea of aging profiles. So whereas synthetic fraud in the, in the walkthrough that I gave you is talking about a synthetic fraudster cashing out at a two-month cycle, a three- to four-month cycle, and a six-month cycle. Well, security companies, law enforcement, creditors, they're starting to see and they understand, okay, these guys are trying to cash out as, as quickly as they can. So in response to that, a lot of fraudsters are starting to just age the profiles out longer. So what happens instead of cashing out at three or six months, what happens when the fraudster decides to age that account, that synthetic profile, for 18 months or two years? The idea being the longer you let it sit, the more legitimate it looks. At the same time, what they're doing is, is they're using dedicated devices because they understand, fraudsters understand this from doing credit card theft. They understand now, okay, a lot of security companies are looking at the device. If I use a different device, it may get flagged as fraud. So what they're doing with synthetic profiles is they're having a dedicated mobile device that they only use for that synthetic identity. That's it. So one mobile device per identity. Or even better, they're having on their laptop, they're having a VM box, a virtual machine, and inside of that VM box, they're using something like AntiDetect to simulate a cell phone or a mobile device that is then connected to or just associated with that one primary synthetic account. All right? So those are the types of variations that we see when it comes to synthetic fraud. The big secret to all this is that organized crime or organized synthetic fraudsters collaborate for maximum success. So what do I mean by that? Let's take the idea of credit piggybacking of these authorized user trade lines that I've spoken about. That's 49% of all these synthetic fraud profiles right now. So you can go on Google, you can look for credit repair, or you can look for authorized user trade lines or credit piggybacking, and you'll come back with a host of results because it's legal. It's legal to do this. You can actually improve your credit by becoming an authorized user on someone else's credit card. The problem is, is that legitimately to pay for that, these companies, these credit repair companies, charge anywhere from $300 up to $3,000 to add you on as an authorized user to one of these accounts. Now, the big thing about cyber criminals is they are a thrifty lot. They are stingy. When it comes to them spending money, they don't like to do that. They like to steal money. So they're not going to spend a lot of money on that. So how does a fraudster, how does a synthetic fraudster take advantage of, of the idea of credit piggybacking without having to spend that kind of money? That's this whole idea of organized cybercrime, this, this world of the forums, the marketplaces, the dark web, and surface web groups. What you can do is you can go on one of these, credit, these criminal marketplaces, and there are people that are selling trade lines secondary and primary trade lines. So instead of $300, you're paying $75 or $100, or even better, what more experienced synthetic fraudsters do is they go on the dark web, they buy a credit card login for $15. So they log into someone else's credit card, and then they add on however many authorized users they want to, however many synthetic profiles they want to as authorized users on that stolen credit card login. The problem is, is that when they add those authorized users on there, even if the legitimate card owner logs in and sees all those authorized users on there and then reports it as fraud, typically it's too late at that point because it's already cycled through the system. It's already, already reported to the synthetic profiles, those credit reports of those synthetic profiles, so that the damage has already been done. The criminal has already basically succeeded at the crime he or she was trying to commit. That's typically the way it is for most cybercrime, this, this idea of collaboration. For example, you can go on the dark web, you can buy kids' social security numbers. You don't have to fish those numbers out. You don't have to steal those numbers yourself. That is there for you. If you don't know how to commit synthetic fraud, there are tutorials you can buy. Not only are there tutorials, but there are specific little groups within each criminal structure, within each criminal website, that talk about how to commit synthetic fraud. So if you don't know how to do it, Someone will partner with you and walk you through it, will help you commit that type of crime. One of the big areas, of course, is this idea because you have to have 
a fake ID at some point. The problem is, is that, again, that, that three necessities of cybercrime, the final necessity is cashing out. If you can't put cash in pocket, you are useless. So you have to be able to launder that money. You have to be able to get cash out of a bank account someplace. To get cash out of a bank account, you typically have to open up a bank account. To open a bank account, you typically have to have a driver's license. That's the thing. So when we were engaged, or when I was engaged in crime, and I ended up serving seven and a half years in prison for this, and I needed to, believe you me, I needed to, it got my mind right. But when I was engaged in crime, when I was doing fake driver's licenses, to, to come up with a fake driver's license, what you had to do, you had to either steal someone's driver's license or you had to talk someone into sending you their state driver's license so you could create a fake one. So you would get a, a, a driver's license in, you would sit down with Photoshop, and you would take days, maybe even a couple of weeks, to come up with this great template. So you would build your own template using Photoshop. So a lot of the times you would have to create the fonts and everything else. So you've got the template built, which takes a lot of time to do that. Once you have the template made, you have to figure out how you're going to print it. Are you going to print it on PVC? Well, if it's PVC, you have to have a PVC card printer, either Data Card or Fargo. Those things are $2,000 plus. And here's the big thing about that. Both Data Card and Fargo know that their printers are used to create fake IDs. So there's this whole verification process about that. The end result is typically a criminal would be like, you know, it's just not worth that. Is there any other avenue? Well, it turns out there is another avenue, and that's called Teslin. And even today, there's a few actual state IDs that use Teslin. So what is Teslin? Well, you go down to the art store, you buy this clear sheet of what's called Teslin, you take it to the house, you print off the template on it, you put it between two sheets of laminate. When you go to laminate it, when the heat hits it, that Teslin turns opaque and hard and kind of sort of maybe mimics what PVC should be, all right? Now, the next problem with that is, of course, the hologram, because back when I was committing these types of fraud, we didn't have multi-spectrum holograms. So what we had to do is we went back down to the art store. We bought this gold interference stuff, which kind of sort of maybe in low light, if you're squinting, mimics what multi-spectrum holograms should do. What the problem was back then is that the end result, you could not use that driver's license in that same state that it was issued in. So I'm, I live in the state of Alabama. I could not use back then, I could not use a fake Alabama driver's license in the state of Alabama. It just didn't look good enough. So I would have to go two to three states over to use that. Today though, law enforcement, especially in the United States, law enforcement has gotten really good about shutting down stateside fake driver's license operations. As a result, they have moved to Hong Kong. Now, back when I was committing this type of fraud, we charged $300 a pop for these driver's licenses, and we sold them like hotcakes. These days, these driver's licenses that you see in front of you, I ordered all four of these coming out of Hong Kong, $40 to $80 a piece. And here's the big secret of this. These driver's licenses will pass in state. All 50 states are available. They will pass in state. They have multi-spectrum holograms on them. They have the encoding on the back. So it, it would not bother me, if I was still a criminal, it would not bother me to walk into a bank and show this driver's license to a teller, either to open up an account or to try to steal someone's money out of the account or any number of things like that. Of course, the problem today is, is that, hey, Brett, you know, we don't need a physical driver's license. If I'm committing fraud, you know, there's so many online accounts, well, I just need a scan of a driver's license. Is there anything at all that can be done? Or is there any services out there that deliver scans of driver's license? Well, fortunately, for criminals anyway, there are. This site here is called secondisolution.ch. Now, .ch, you may think that stands for China, but in criminal speak, .ch stands for cha-ching. So this site, Second Eye Solution, delivers scans of fake driver's licenses. And here's one that I had created. This is a scan of my driver's license that I sent them in. I was like, hey, make this driver's license for me. So this is, this is exactly what they deliver. This is $30. Now, I know what you're thinking. If you're a criminal, you're like, hey, Brett, you know, that's great and everything. $30, that's cheap. But why on earth would I want to put my face on a fake driver's license? Can't we put someone else's face on a fake driver's license? Well, at Second Eye Solutions, you can indeed do that for $30. They will put someone else's face on whatever driver's license that you want to put on. Of course, I know what you're saying. But, Brett, wait a second. Wait a second here. 
Now, a lot of times, you got to take that selfie with that driver's license. How are you going to handle that? Sure, you can't, right? Well, you know what? Don't you worry your pretty little heart about it. At Second Eye Solutions, they've got you covered as well. For $50, they will have that gentleman take that picture with that fake ID. Oh, yeah. And guess what? It doesn't end there. It does not end there. Is there a specific type of security that you're trying to bypass? If there is, just check the box. That's right. Second Eye Solutions will deliver a product to defeat any type of specific security that you're trying to bypass. It's this type of collaboration, this type of system, and it's not just for IDs. It's across the entire spectrum of cybercrime. It's this type of thing that facilitates cybercrime. Why cybercrime is so successful, this collaboration is working together to commit crime to victimize people. The big secret of it all as you probably guessed by now, is that cybercrime is not rocket science. It's not complicated. Because of the platform that's out there, it's very easy for criminals to get in and engage in this type of crime, which brings us to this webinar today and the products and services that iOvation is offering to help stop this type of crime from happening. And at that, I will turn it over to Brooke. Thank you, Brett. So interesting. Uh, we really appreciate all of your insights on that. Uh, before I go any further, I wanted to take a poll from the audience. So if you wouldn't mind taking a moment, looking at the question on your screen and answering for whatever uh, answer fits your business. Has your business experienced synthetic identity fraud? Uh, let me know, yes, it's a very large problem. Yes, it's a growing problem. Or no, it's not a problem. So here's our results uh, so far. So we have about a third saying, yes, it's a very large problem, less than a quarter saying not a problem at all. Um, definitely the largest percentage is looking at it being a growing problem, something that we're going to be seeing more and more of. And, you know, Brooke, one, one of the things that, you know, I'm looking at this, uh, this poll as well. And here's mm -hmm. the thing. If, if you think it's not a problem, you may just not be seeing it. I mean, typically what we see with synthetic fraud or what we used to see uh, now that companies and organizations are understanding what it is, is that synthetic fraud was just simply recognized as a person who wasn't paying the bills. Mm -hmm. So they, they may not even know that a synthetic fraud is going on. Absolutely. It's being mischaracterized as some other kind of fraud or some other kind of scheme. Right. Great insight. Yeah, thanks. I kind of wanted to just kind of take a moment um, and talk briefly about a few of the ways that you can protect your consumers and businesses after we heard all of the schemes that are happening. I'd be good to know what you can do about it. Uh, TransUnion and iOvation uh, are able to combine digital and personal identity solutions, creating this unmatched network of both offline and online identity that makes your transactions of your consumers more secure and it protects your business against fraudulent schemes, including the use of synthetic identities. And all the while, this is providing a fast and smooth experience for your good customers. Device recognition in particular is quite effective with synthetic identity fraud because it's immune to the variances of identity. So things like velocity checks can detect anomalous behaviors or suspicious activities. And then you can look at reputation checks to identify the devices that have been associated with confirmed fraud in the past. And as Brett just mentioned, that might be synthetic identity fraud or it might come through as another kind of fraud like loan default or credit card fraud, but in fact is using synthetic identities. With device recognition, you're not worrying about the synthetic identities being used to access the account, but you're using the device itself to identify the potential that this transaction has fraud associated with it. You can also enhance that device recognition with things like email and phone verification. For example, our data has shown that 32% of new email addresses are created with the intent of committing fraud, which is crazy. So a third of new email addresses are created for the purpose of fraud. So if you know an email address was just created today and now it's being used to create a new account or apply for a credit card or even change the account details uh, within an existing account, you know something funny might be going on there and it might be worth a little bit more insight, a little bit more in looking into what's going on. Uh, in a similar way, a phone number is, can be used in multiple fraud schemes or if it has any other kinds of anomalous behaviors that can trigger a high risk score associated just with the phone number. So another way to kind of start to flag some suspicious behaviors that might be going on in the transaction. TransUnion also has a purpose-built synthetic fraud model, which is another way that you can enhance your ability to identify those good consumers from false identity. 
All in all, you can never solve for all of it, but you can certainly make it harder for fraudsters. I want to thank Brett again for such a great webinar. We really appreciate all your insights. Uh, the floor is open now. If anyone has any questions they'd like to ask Brett or myself, please go ahead and enter those questions into the Q&A box, and we will be more than happy to start answering some of those questions. You know, what I like, what I like Brooke, so much uh, as, we're, as we're waiting for those questions is typically what we see is that a security product tends to have some sort of weakness. So you have to have a layered approach to things. And what we're seeing with, with Iovation's product and partnered with TransUnion is we have that layered approach. The sum of the parts are much more valuable than just the parts themselves. That, that, that synthesis of working together is really effective. Absolutely. It really is a powerful way of combining those two pieces. One of the questions that um, I've, I heard kind of feeding in earlier is really a little bit more, Brett, from you. Why did you become a fraudster originally? What, what kind of propelled that? What, what started all of this? Well, I, would, I want people to understand that a criminal, I don't care if it's a, a cyber criminal or a, a, a real-world physical criminal, I was both. There, there's no redeeming feature to that person. I, I, would, I was 40 years basically being a degenerate. All right, uh, really no saving grace to me whatsoever. And I'm very fortunate today to have the opportunity to be recognized as, as this leading voice or what have you when it comes to cybersecurity and cybercrime. Where did I begin my life of crime? I began it at 10 years old. Um, I came from uh, Eastern Kentucky. My mom was basically a, a fraudster, one of the head fraudsters in the area. Uh, she was an abusive parent. And um, my first crime was shoplifting. My mom had, uh, she used to go out and party with men. She would leave me and my sister at home. She left us at home for a few days. We didn't have any food in the house. My sister walks in. She's got a pack of pork chops with her, and we start stealing food. That moves over into clothes and, of course, toys, jewelry, music, everything else. My mom comes home, sees the stuff, and she joins us. And that, that was where my entry into crime. And I'm not saying, so anyone out there that, that may think, oh, you know, it's his childhood led to it or he's blaming his childhood, absolutely not. There are people who had far worse upbringings than I did, and they turned out just fine. I just chose to commit to, to keep committing crime as I entered into adulthood. Uh, why did I do that? For cash. Uh, there were three motivations for cybercrime, cash, status, ideology. Mine was cash. It was what I could do with the cash. I'm a guy who, because, because of the childhood that I had, a tick is, it's not enough for me to tell someone that I love them, the people who are important to me. I can't just show it in a relationship or tell them that I love them. I have to usually buy them some sort of expensive crap to put some sort of dollar amount on my mm -hmm. love of what I feel about the relationship. So uh, historically, that's been my, my entry or my reasons for committing crime is to steal cash in order to, you know, show this love, to, to gain acceptance from other people. Okay. Mm. It's really interesting that that's, it started out with such good intent. It doesn't always lead well, there, but um, we're so glad you. <laughs> you know, I, I, yeah, you know, I can't, uh, you know, when I, as a minor, I'm not going to take responsibility for the types of crime and fraud that the adults you know, had me committing and, or and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I don't think I'm responsible for that. But when I'm an adult, those are my choices. I chose to victimize people. I chose to be a liar for, you know, all these years. Mm -hmm. so, so those are my choices. My sister, for example, other than that one shoplifting experience, she never commits mm -hmm. crime again. She goes off to be a great teacher, a great parent, a great citizen. I'm simply the guy who didn't stop, who continued on. And, you know, today I am extremely grateful for the life that has been given to me. Um, I certainly didn't do anything to deserve it, but uh, now that I have this life, now that I see what it's like to try to help people instead of hurt people, I'll be damned if there's anything that I'm going to do to go against that. I mean, it's, uh, it's much better than anything I've ever had and much better than anything I ever thought I would have. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. That's, I appreciate your openness and, and sharing all of the insights that you have. Another question came in, uh, how can I reveal synthetic identity fraud attempts in real time? You know, that's, that's a big part of this. You don't want to hurt or stop your uh, customer transactions that are coming through by putting up a bunch of walls that make it hard for your good consumers to do business. But you certainly want to be able to stop um, the bad business, identify those synthetic identities as quickly as possible. 
In fact, Iovation's uh, device recognition is built to be real time. So in 100 milliseconds, less than, um, you're able to see is there weird velocity patterns? Are they applying for a bunch of, of policies all at once? Are, they, are there other weird things happening? Is the device that's being used, has it been used for fraud in the past, or is it associated with other accounts that have been used for fraud, including synthetic identity fraud? All of that uh, insight is coming back to you in real time. So if it's a good consumer, nothing funny is going on, you're pushing that transaction through. They don't even know that there was a fraud check done. It's very easy, seamless, streamlined. If there is something funny going on, you can review that transaction. You can deny it outright. You can use whatever business workflows uh, make sense to your business. But really, the, the key there is uh, minimizing any friction for those good consumers, creating friction for uh, potential fraud consumers, and, and doing a little bit more review, a little bit more research on those transactions. Just, just to feed in, into that with you as well, I mean, 100 milliseconds is extremely fast. So there's very little friction that's going on. But understand how this fraud actually works. So we've got the criminal that, that's building the profile. When it comes time to open up accounts or to cash out, that criminal is going to try to do that at, typically as fast as they can. Because once they start cashing out, there's a time limit. There's a time limit on that. It, at some point, he or she is not going to be able to, to profit from that synthetic identity again. So this idea of looking for patterns. How often is that person applying for credit? Is it something that a normal person would do? How, how much is that person trying, is he or she applying for loans from four different banks at the same time? No one does that. No one legitimate does that. So this idea that Iovation has of, of looking at these patterns of this type of velocity and things like that, it's extremely effective in countering synthetic fraud. Absolutely. And good to know from someone that did that kind of crime. That's the way. That's a, a good yes. way to solve for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, uh, Brett, I'm curious too. Do you have uh, kind of further explanations, ideas on how fraudsters are able to target and attack businesses to commit a synthetic sure. identity fraud? You, yeah, yeah. What else do you got? Mm -hmm. So, so there's a, there's a few things. So you have to understand that the more experienced a criminal is, the more reconnaissance they do, the more research they do. Uh, we were reading, I say we, because I still kind of identify with cybercrime. Uh, I'm on the dark web every day doing research and everything else. But in 2011, cyber criminals were reading white papers on browser fingerprinting, stuff like that. So cyber criminals read white papers. They read indictments. They read news stories. Cyber criminals, as far as I know, they are the only people who read the terms of services on a website. Well, cyber criminals and attorneys, which I would argue there's not much difference sometimes. But anyway, that, that's what we see is, is criminals tend to research a lot. So that they're reading all these types of things. Not only that, but this idea that criminals collaborate with each other. So if, a, if one person knows that a company, so some creditor out there is easily marked to commit synthetic fraud. What that criminal, he or she is going to do, but let's take a site like uh, Alphabet was shut down in 2017. When Alphabet was shut down, it had 240,000 members, 240,000 criminals that were intent on breaking the law, either drug trafficking or fraud. That was it, okay? So say you've got, say you've got a member of a site like Alphabet, which has a 240,000 member structure. That member has some technique. He knows some business, some creditor that's easily victimized committing synthetic fraud. What that criminal will do is he will share it with his small network within that website, say 10 or 15 people. So he shares that exploit, that website, that merchant, creditor, retailer, whatever, with his small group. Once they mine it out as much as they possibly can, They'll either sell that or they'll release it into the wild amongst everyone else within that website, within that 240,000 member structure. So it's, it's basically this open source platform of sharing information, of facilitating crime. So if, and that's one of the things that, that, that I was responsible of, of building was this idea of sharing information that, that yes, you may, you know, share information that would cost you money, but the idea of everyone working together to commit crime is what makes cybercrime so effective to commit. And it's also what makes cybercrime so difficult to stop because you've got these members that are partnering with each other. You've got these members that somebody will understand part of the puzzle to commit a specific type of crime, but not all of it. So by working together with each other, all these pieces of the puzzle come together 
and it makes that crime much more profitable for people to commit. And that's that's one of the reasons that uh, we see companies, a lot of companies, are being eaten alive. You'll see, uh, and I've worked with a few of these companies, you'll see these small little occurrences of synthetic fraud. It's just like, like they're testing it all of a sudden. Two or three months later, it blows wide open. And that's typically what we're seeing there is one guy understands the exploit. He's mining it out on his behalf every now and then. He's seeing how well it works and everything. Then he shares it with his small group. And then from there, it blows up even further. So you see these, these little stepping stones. The first guy coming in to test and exploit, the small group after that, and then it goes into the massive explosion mode, basically a, a human botnet that's committing these types of crimes. Oh, man. That's quite the image. I. Uh, being able to stop those fraud rings, those bigger networks, and identifying them small and then at the growing, that sounds like an important piece to uh, combat them. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Brett, thank you. That's a great explanation. Um, it looks like we've covered our questions. Is there anything else you wanted to cover before we wrap up today? I think that's it. I just appreciate uh, the work that you guys are doing. I appreciate the people who are listening today. If you need anything, and I do mean anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, my thing is, is I'm trying to make up for it. I, I don't think I can ever make up for the damage I've caused, but, but I'm trying. And, you know, I, I really want to try to help people and organizations as much as I possibly can. So don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. We, we so appreciate uh, your insight, giving time to, to our audience and, and telling us what's going on on the inside so we can, we can try and protect our businesses and our consumers. Before we sign off today, I wanted to take a moment and uh, share this uh, infographic that Iovation recently created on mobile fraud. That's a huge trend that we're seeing. More and more good consumers are using mobile devices, and fraudsters are mimicking that behavior to try and hide their schemes. Um, and so we recently created uh, an infographic to kind of show those trends in, in mobile traffic and the mobile fraud that's being committed. So please download this free to you. Uh, get a little bit more insight on what's happening there with, with mobile fraud. Also, wanted to make sure, if you haven't already seen it, that you are able to log in and watch our first webinar with Brett Johnson, Combating Social Engineering and Account Takeover. It's a great webinar, certainly worth, worth the hour to listen to his insights on, on how account takeover is being done, as well as social engineering. Uh, thank you, everyone, for logging in today. Uh, Brett, thank you again. We appreciate it, and we will see you thank next you. time.